Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus didn't answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus entered the region of an old enemy of Israel. The old Phoenician kingdom centered in Tyre and Sidon centuries earlier, and it came under the rule the rule of Eth Baal, a priest of Astarte. He slew his royal predecessor, took over the kingdom, and fathered an infamous daughter, the princess of Sidon, Jezebel herself. She married Ahab, ruled the roost, turned Israel almost altogether to Baal worship, and it would appear scared the fearless Elijah Witless. She's listed as among the great evils of Ahab, 1 Kings 16. Of course, the passing years had made a difference. But old memories and old enmities die hard and live long, don't they? Jews cared little for non-Jews, but they harbored special feelings toward Samaritans and Sidonians, even if they were Greeks. Mark 7.26 tells us that this Sidonian woman was a Greek. Uh, she was a Greek and therefore a non-Jew, but she also made her home in that ancient Phoenician kingdom territory, and that didn't do her any favors in the eyes of the Jews. Matthew reduces the entire incident to the truths he wants to stress. Uh, Jesus, in whom the kingdom of God was being revealed, entered this foreign region. And before you know it, the sentence opens with the Greek word, look. Before you know it, uh, a woman follows them all the way into some house. She sees them, follows them, keeps on following them. Mark seven twenty four to 30 fills us in on that. And as she follows, she keeps on calling on Jesus, keeps on calling him the son of David, a messianic title, don't you know? Uh, she wants the Israelite Messiah to show her mercy in connection with her daughter. She keeps on uh, shouting, keeps on following and Jesus keeps moving and not saying a word to her. The disciples grew tired of her, and they repeatedly, there's an imperfect tense in the Greek text, they repeatedly ask Jesus, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. That's 1523. Now, 1524 is not addressed to the woman, but to the disciples. 1524 is in response to the disciples saying, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. However, 1524 begins with the word 
but. It's in the Greek text, and the King James Version rightly says so. The NIV takes liberties here, as it does in a number of texts in this very section. They say, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He says, but I was not sent, but to the lost house of Israel. What's this but business? It would appear that they said something and he took issue with it. And that's precisely the truth of the matter. For when they are saying, uh, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us, they're implying that he should do for her what she wants done, so that they could be done with her. They're saying, not chase her away, but give her what she wants. Send her away with what she wants, because we're sick and tired of her yelling after us. The word that is used for send away in this text is also used to mean release or free or loose. It's set free, that is. It's used of Barabbas, you remember. It's also used of forgiveness. You need to see Matthew 18:27 and Luke 13:12, where uh, it's used of a woman loosed from her illness. So, what I think we should be hearing is the disciples saying, uh, release her from her trouble. Give her what it is that she needs. Send her away by giving her her request. For we're sick and tired of listening to her. And his response is, but... I was sent only to the lost house of Israel. Now, whatever we make of the word uh, Jesus used, his response to the disciples is clear enough. They repeatedly say, implying, give her what she's asking. And he reminds them that his mission was to Israel. They knew that, of course, and they were glad of it. But they knew he had healed a Gentile centurion's servant. Still, they had no heart for this situation, because if they wanted her freed from her suffering, resulting from her daughter's illness, you see, it was only so that they could be rid of her. Finally, the woman gets to Jesus and kneels before him, asking for help in 1525. He tells her, it isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. He uses a diminutive diminutive term. The Jerusalem Bible renders it little dogs or puppies, you see. And he said, it's not right to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. We read that and many of us take offense. We think it's rude. But Matthew records it without any sense that there's rudeness in it. He isn't embarrassed in any way by Jesus. The truth is, Jesus isn't implying that she or those like her are in a class with dogs. He's using common speech for no other reason than to insist on Israel's primary place in the unfolding drama of redemption. And he was never embarrassed about that truth. You need to see John 4.22 for a tonally important text where he says to the Samaritan woman, You don't know what you worship. We know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews. Still, though he isn't insulting this woman here, he is provoking her. And he knows, I'm dead certain of it, he knows that she's up to it. She makes it clear that she doesn't want the children to be left without food. She would just like some of the crumbs that fall from the table while the children are being fed. I'll settle for the crumbs, she shrewdly and desperately responds. 
Why is he making it difficult for this woman? Well, we think he is. But she may not have thought at all that uh, he was making it difficult. She loved this daughter of hers. And consequently, that would have made all apparent uh, racial slurs and needling remarks or whatever. That would have made all of those feel like no burden at all. But she had more than that in her, and Jesus knew it. She loved her daughter, but she had more than that in her. Jesus had met another couple of foreigners, a centurion and a woman of probably ill repute and a Samaritan into the bargain. And both of them showed remarkable faith. They showed faith that should have made proud Jews feel ashamed. And here's another foreigner that proud Jews wanted rid of. A nuisance at best. That's what they thought of her. But Jesus provokes her and brings out before their eyes what was really in her. If she had come and politely asked for help and been given it with hardly a word exchanged, we would never have known. Nor would the proud Jewish disciples that this woman indeed had great faith. I don't believe Jesus worked with the woman as he did to teach her a lesson. He wasn't teaching her a lesson of patience and fine stubbornness. No, she would have learned that kind of thing. He didn't commend her for her patience or stubbornness. He didn't even commend her for her love for her daughter. He commended her for her great faith. Once more, the children, that is the Jews, the apostles, once again, the children had seen that someone outside the family had shown such faith in Jesus as would embarrass a a host of Israelites. Well, this foreign element is prominent in Matthew along with the Israel first notion. It culminates in Matthew twenty eight nineteen, but be sure to see eight ten through thirteen. Again, Jesus didn't commend her for her love of her daughter. He commends her for believing that the God who sent this Saviour to Israel to feed his children, would not begrudge crumbs to a needy non-family member. She believed that the God who was now showing his reign in Jesus of Nazareth and showing his faithful love to his children would know how she felt about her child. And she believed that God was so showing his power in and through Jesus that just the crumbs or scraps from his table would be more than adequate for her needs. This remarkable faith was brought out into the open by Christ's prodding her. Israel had much to learn from such a woman and Christ saw to it that they got the message. Matthew understands that Israel needs to know, that the Messianic Jews need to know, that people outside the Jewish nation had shown such faith in the Messiah. And that is part of why the message is there. Outsiders saw, recognized, and embraced the authority, the kingdom authority of God manifested in Jesus and saw it in all its generosity as to be used and expressed toward certainly Israel first, but not just to the children, to everyone in need. And who's to say... Who's to say he wasn't smiling as he bandied words with her, huh? 
Who's to say?